What's up, Mushroom Fam? Trying to uh, dial in my camera here. Um, if anyone could verify that we're getting audio, please uh, give me a thumbs up or I don't even know if I can see the chat. All right, I can see the chat. So if anyone can hear me, um, please give me a thumbs up. I'm just gonna keep setting up here until some more people join. What's up? My Myco Co, can you hear me? Got a nice uh, monster energy. All right, we're getting some thumbs up. So it's been a while since I've done a live stream and a lot has happened since then. So for those of you who don't know, uh, we just had our first child back in December. So it's been a little bit of a challenge to try and keep up with all the videos, but I thought that I would hop on the live stream this morning for our last harvest of cordyceps of the year um, so i i like to do my cordyceps from about november until march or april these ones kind of stretched out a little bit towards the end of april um, the reasoning is because of the temperature here in colorado it starts to get pretty warm around may um, and the cordyceps like the cool temperatures so I got a couple harvests that I've been working on um, making a tincture. So I have a few runs that I sent in to uh, Flourish Labs in Oregon. And um, I've been working with um, Uza Labs, which originated in Boulder, Colorado. And they're up north and they have a little tabletop extraction machine that I've been working on. For a few months with them to try to dial in our cordyceps tinctures it's been you know a lot of troubleshooting and a big learning curve to get that dialed in but i do have some cordyceps that i freeze dried that i'm planning to do another test run shortly with them um, so shout out to Uza labs i know that they did some kind of a podcast with uh, micropreneur if you're interested in learning more about their product go check that out um, and then as far as the uh, the rest of the updates I've been working a lot with these uh, micro well plates so I have a video come out pretty soon I just have to finish editing that up but I've uh, done a lot of trial runs now with these micro well plates which I really like so the the topic of today's video is going to be how do we get spores from these cordyceps into this 96 well plate so my goal for this year is to create about 96 different isolates um, single spore so cordyceps has asco spores so it's really important to do this um, it's pretty time sensitive in that manner because the asco spores will start to grow on a fresh petri dish right away and i also did a big video series on uh, microscopy earlier in the winter so if you haven't checked that out um, i've got my stereoscope ready for once these cordyceps start dropping spores i'm going to have to pull those off the petri dishes and transfer them into these uh, wells unlike basidio spores which i've been working with which can be easily transferred in solution so there's a little bit about the micro well on that uh that microscopy video mostly it's going to be useful to uh, verify the mated uh, diploid pairing so you can see i marked a few of these plates with uh, d's and m's so when you're doing a dilution it's really hard to tell uh, a plate that is a haploid, 
especially at a lower dilution. This one's pretty easy to see that there's a bunch of different matings going on, but um, as more and more people join in, um, I guess I'll just keep going with uh, the process for the micro well plates. So um, this one I saved for some cordyceps, which I tried to put those ASCO spores in solution and it never really germinated. So that is why I'm going to kind of hybridize that method. I'm going to be using this uh, petroleum jelly to stick the fruiting bodies to the lid of the Petri dish. And then once they're stuck to the lid, they'll start releasing spores. And over the course of an hour or four hours, I can look at that, um, that spore print under the microscope and on the peripheral edges, I'll be able to find single haploid ascospores. So then I'm going to carefully um, cut those out with my scalpel and transfer them into these individual wells. So the benefit of these micro wells is that I can have many, many, many single isolates on one dish and they're kind of isolated because of that, that wall. So um, if there is any weird contaminants, you can just tape off that, that well and nothing really happens um, or it can, kind of contains it into that little well. Um, so the benefit is that if I wanted to do that on Petri dishes, it's going to really take up space in my lab. So it just shrinks everything down. So that's what I'm really excited about. I also have my uh, MMX3 slant. Um, if you haven't seen that whole series, I have a series on breeding cordyceps. And then I've got my MMX5, which this one um, I might bring back into production or sell, sell it on my Etsy again. I had mixed concerns about this one. It didn't perform really well on rice, but I started switching all my cordyceps over to uh, Milo recently and I've been getting some pretty decent results. So I guess I can start going through these different jars. So I have um, a, a batch of the MMX3 that I ran and then also these are just random strains that I was gifted. Um, they're from you know the wild, there's a couple wild strains and then uh, a commercial strain here and I just think that I'm getting all these weird mutations. So that's an early indication that it might be time to breed your cordyceps. Or actually when they come out of the wild, they're usually not trained. So, um, but yeah, so I've got this really cool, like large blobby one that I've seen a few people growing out strains like that. It gives you a nice yield. And if you're going for cordycepin, I think that that would be a pretty potent strain to cultivate. And then I've got some of these weird, like stretchy ones. So what's up everyone that's uh, joining in? Um, I'm going to start diving into breeding my cordyceps. So I tried doing some different bottles because I thought that maybe the shape of the container could affect how they grow. So I have this old rum bottle that I grew some cordyceps in and I really like some of these uh, really like spiky looking phenotypes. So I'm gonna try to dig a few of those out. And then, yeah, so this, I mean, I basically just sprinkled a couple grains on the bottom of this jar and I was impressed with how many fruiting bodies I got just from, you know, a couple dozen grains of Milo. Uh, and then, yeah, you can see there's like a really blobby one here, a really skinny one here. And I think that I'm gonna, gonna start just by cloning a couple of um, the blobbier ones. And then I did try a mono tub which had some difficulties. Um, there was a little bit of drying out going on, but you can see I got some decent looking 
bowling pin shaped ones. So I'm going to start just by cloning some of these and you can see they're uh, starting to get the features where they'll start uh, releasing those spores. So just some really cool tubs. There's possible uh, contaminant. They're like two those two little blotches right there. So I'm going to have to be very careful. But I'm definitely going to harvest those, clone a couple, and then I will start um, attaching them to the lids of these Petri dishes. And there's another method um, that I did called hyperbreeding. So I did that last year just to kind of revigorate these strains, and that worked really well. Um, I got a couple decent rounds out of a tub but the tubs are hard it, it kind of dries out quickly and i've experienced a lot of contaminants so that's why i scaled back down to the jars for um these last flushes of the season all right guys so i got my flow hood off for this procedure Mostly because uh, the audio gets kind of muffled when I'm running my flow hood. But um, I'll just be extra careful. And I'm going to throw on a mask for this one. Just because this is the last cordyceps I have. So I don't want to mess it up. Alright, so I'll kind of move this in. And then I will start off by just cleaning my workstation. I'm going to set up setting up my workstation right here. you guys can get a good view of this and then I'm also going to need a marker so hang on Got my marker. All right, so someone suggested another camera for close ups. I can try to really get as close as I can. So first things first, let's uh, get some harvest going. Oh, most exciting part. So these were inoculated back in February when it was about zero degrees here in Denver. And today it's a nice balmy 55 outside, a little bit rainy. So that's the perfect time because the rain will help pull those spores, all the trichoderma and penicillium that's sprouting. Um, those should be kind of pulled to the floor. I just deep cleaned my lab and here we go. So first I'll just um, harvest some fresh fruiting bodies right into the petri dish. And I really want to get this on camera. So you can see I've got these bowling pin shaped ones that are really looking spiny. Uh, it's going to go 
go ahead and set those in there. These are some really ideal ones for breeding. And then I'm gonna clone this guy here because it's pretty massive. So as a commercial farmer, that's what I'm shooting for. That was the tub right there. And I'll get that out of the way. So we've got some beautiful looking cordyceps that I'm going to clone this big guy right here. Uh, this is shaped like a little bowling pin. And cordyceps are usually pretty difficult to clone just because they're kind of long and thin. But I'm going to be breaking this in half and then using a fresh scalpel blade, preferably a number 11, that's what I like to use. And then I'm gonna clone this out onto this dish. Maybe use a couple. And my opinion on this is that it will preserve this mutation. So over time, cordyceps tends to drift away from its original strain. And like some other mushrooms out there, you can hold on to that phenotype as long as you're using the original mycelium um, for a little while. There's definitely limitations. All right, so. Pulling out a fresh number 11 blade. And then I'm just gonna set this right here. So yeah. Not a very clean break, but I've got a lot of tissue to work with right here. Kind of a softer mushroom. So really mushy. Pretty difficult to clone, which is why I'm going to be collecting spores very shortly. So there's a little piece of tissue there. And then I'm going to work up a little bit higher, so maybe it's not as mushy. They tend to be a little drier near the top up up here. So got another tissue right there. All right, 
if I'm lucky, I can salvage this piece here near the top where it should be releasing spores. So one way to verify is that if you put it in a clear petri dish, you should be able to see the asco spores starting to come off. And that's a really good one right there. You can see that, see that whiteness on the plate. That means that these mushrooms are actively dropping spores. So it's a perfect time um, as they mature the little tendrils will develop these like spiky features on them and then that is where the spores will be released. So I'm going to go ahead and prepare some of these petri dishes over here with some petroleum jelly and then I'm going to attach them to the lids. So this is just regular Vaseline. Um, it comes pretty sterile and I've used this a bunch of times as you can see in my previous breeding projects. But the main purpose of this is to get the mushrooms to stick to the surface of the lid. And that way you're getting a better dispersion of spores. If Compared to if you just like left the mushroom directly on the surface of the plate. So, howdy to everyone who's joining in. We're just breeding some cordyceps. So right now I am putting the Vaseline on the lids of these plates. And I just harvested these bowling pin ones from our mono tub. And I'll probably do about three from this batch. And then I've got some really interesting ones from the wild that I collected. Well, I was gifted them. I didn't collect them. But I'll try to uh, collect some of these spores too. And then I just thought this one was cool because I got some fruiting bodies off of like I don't know, maybe four or five grams worth of grains at the bottom of this jar. So I thought that was pretty neat. And then we've got this rum jar. And I'm really interested in getting some of these weird, like spiky looking ones. And I'll probably end up cloning those. All right. Okay, so got my dishes all prepared with some Vaseline on the surface. And you can see right here is a perfect example that this cordyceps is starting to release some spores even in that short amount of time. Can't really get a good glimpse because of the lighting. But once I start pulling these off, you'll be able to see and there's a little condensation happening as well. But this piece that I took off the clone is perfect to stick to the surface here. So I'm just gonna blob it right on, just like that.
And I will do a little timestamp here. So it's 9.25. And maybe by 11 o'clock, I'll come back and start pulling off those uh, single ASCO spores from the first dish. And then I'll probably eat these. So I really like making a tea out of these cordyceps scraps. And they have a compound called cordycepin. So cordycepin is similar to ADP in its structure. And that produces a very similar effect to caffeine or something like a stimulant without the, the crash. So that's the idea. And there's all these anti anti, I guess, um, fatigue, anti-fatigue properties that the cordyceps have. So I'm going to go ahead and just, I'm going to swap out this blade for a fresh one just because I kind of roughed up that one mushroom. Um, yeah. So these are loaded up with petroleum jelly and... I am just sticking them to the surface so that I can collect those ASCO spores. And there's some condensation, but over here you can see there's a residual spore print that's already being produced by these mushrooms. And I tried to collect them on a glass slide and transfer them but they tend to dry out pretty easily, so that is why I'm doing this method. All right. So it's 9.28. This one's a little bit younger, so not as pronounced, but it still should be releasing spores. And this is a time sensitive procedure. So if you leave these on for too long, they'll start to germinate on the, on the Petri dish. And it's not a bad thing, but you won't be able to selectively breed as easily because it's gonna be more random and those spores will intertwine with each other. And it's really difficult to tell if you have haploid or diploid cultures at that point. I'm just time stamping these so that I know I'm going to write a little bit. This is one's a younger. And that just gives me an idea of when I should be looking for the spores. So I have a whole video series um, on the next steps during this process. It can be pretty tedious. Um, you can collect these single spores with a loop but you're going to need a microscope. Uh, stereoscope works well because then you can see the whole plate, but you can do it with a compound scope. And if you're interested in microscopy, I do have a new series that I made this winter and that's gonna come into play in a little bit once we get into our micro well breeding. So, after I isolate a bunch of haploids, I'm going to transfer them 
onto this micro well plate. So each well will contain a single ASCO spore. And then I can use the tip of a scalpel or a syringe and kind of transfer that mycelium into liquid cultures. That's what I'm gonna try next, like little jars of liquid cultures. Then I'll have a whole bunch of variants and then I'll be able to scale that up into jars and hopefully I'll get some really nice phenotypes that way. I probably won't be able to get to them until the fall, but cordyceps are pretty slow at growing. And this is more of just my, my hobby, which is why I get super excited. Cordyceps is my hobby and then gourmet mushrooms is my business. So, but they all kind of intertwine with each other. And I'm getting down to some of the smaller ones here, which let's not discriminate. Maybe the small ones have uh, more cordyceps in. All right, so that'll make up a nice tea later. And now I have to grab a couple more Petri dishes and try to fish these out. So if anyone has any questions, I will open up the chat and I'll be right back as I get some more Petri dishes. Feel free to ask questions, um, comment on your own Cordyceps projects. sure I can't see the past history so sorry about that but I really want to clone this fat one here and then I'm going to uh, try to pull spores off these really stringy cool looking ones Interested. This is a potato dextrose auger. And I like to shrink wrap them to keep them fresh. And they're easily accessible for situations like today. is back with our baby. Here, I'm gonna go get some new gloves. Hi. <laughs> this is our son Nolan and uh, it's my wife Addie. Hello. <laughs> and that's our mushroom spawn behind us and 
these are our cordyceps that we're breeding. So I have to get new gloves though. You never know what can happen with a live stream. some fresh gloves. More excitement coming up. Let's crack this open. So these uh, mycology lids work perfectly. You could just shoot that liquid culture in and then I've been growing on Milo. So I'm gonna try to harvest this guy first. Thanks for tuning in from Finland. Get that guy. Really cool chonker. So someone asked if I ever tried cordyceps in a bag. So I have. I found it a little bit difficult to uh, to keep them kind of uniform. They tend to be like a little blobby, but I think moving towards bags in the future might work. I really wanted to do tubs, but it just dries out pretty quickly. Um, I did try bags though. I don't. I don't know why I didn't stick with it. I know that quite a few people do it. It just kind of didn't look uniform to me. So look at that nice tissue there. I'm gonna clone this fat one. Now this is much better than that other one I tried to clone. Fresh white tissue. And of course it got static from the plate. There we go. I'll maybe do a couple of those. Fresh white. And then I'm just cutting a little pyramid shape in there. And out comes the tissue. Alright, so then I'll call this one 2023 Fat Blob. And for anyone out there, the uh, Cordyceps has a really unique flavor. It's almost like like a spicy flavor. And this, this one that I just cut open is really emanating that flavor. I don't know if there's any correlation to the smell and the potency of Cordyceps, but that one was really smelly in a good way. 
So I've got these really cool tendril ones. And I'm going to, once again, put some petroleum jelly on, on the lid. For everyone tuning in, this is, the purpose of this is to stick it to the surface so that the spores will drop onto the petri dish. And then I can isolate those spores. Hopefully we get a nice variance of different phenotypes and whatnot that I can select for. So I'll go ahead and harvest these. So someone asked how do cordyceps differ from other mushrooms. So these ones really like the cold. That's going to be important. Anything above 64-ish, it's going to have a really hard time growing. Another thing about cordyceps is that they tend to senesce or mutate pretty quickly. So that is why breeding them pretty regularly is important. Um, some of these strains are two or three years old and they're still giving me good results, but once they start to start looking weird, it's a good indication that you should breed them. And they're an ascospore, so that's different than a basidiospore, which is why I'm putting the Vaseline on the roof of these petri dishes. Um, so you can't really collect an ascospore spore print and then rehydrate them onto agar like normal. So that's why I'm trying to collect the spores in real time. And then in about two or three hours from now, I'll go back to these Petri dishes under the microscope and see if I can isolate some of the spores that will be around the peripheral and they should be separated by then and then I can transfer them onto these micro wells and then I will systematically cross them in the future. So that's kind of what the idea is where normally you can breed other type of mushrooms like basidiospores pretty easily just with using streak plates but this is a little more technical. This one's really an ideal cluster that I like to do just, you know, for the market. It's, it's pretty, pretty ideal cordyceps right there. So greetings from India. Thanks for joining. And uh, yeah, it's about to be summer here. So getting really busy these days, but I love when I get a chance to do some lab work like this. And we've got some new, new mushrooms that we're bringing to market this year. Um, we've got a mukutake, which is like a oyster and a shiitake mushroom combined almost. So I'm excited for that. Um, And then we're tr we're trying some outdoor projects. So yeah. All right. Now we got this random fatty that I'm gonna try to pull out and throw on this next plate. And then I have no idea how to get these out. So <laughs> that might be 
a disaster, but I do have this longer scalpel that maybe I can knock some off. Yeah, so this is a little naked one, but I'll see what it gives us. Yeah, and someone asked about the origin. So uh, some of this was the uh, MMX3, and then some of it was gifted to me. Um, they're just some wild cordyceps strains. One of them was from the UK, I believe, uh, New York. And uh, I have a pretty extensive library at this point, but the hyperbreeding one was from the bowling pins that I collected. Alright, and then I've got some space for one of those really spiky ones. So this is going to be a challenge, but for anyone out there, you can use old rum or whiskey bottles. It's really fun to grow in those. And I am going to try to pluck out one of these spiky guys. There we go. It's like uh, building a ship in a bottle. Yep. Wow, this is one of my favorite ones so far. Really spiky and hopefully it launches off a million spores. Alright, so I'm going to label that guy Spiky, Spiky Rum 2023, and it is 9.49, so all of our plates are used up, might try to get a couple more of these guys out of here, reap. Now that's a pretty fun way to harvest. It's like fishing for cordyceps. Oh, that's another cool one too. I'm going to find some room to throw this one on. All right, that was super fun. Boom. Let me back this up. Maybe I can answer some questions for a few minutes. Yeah, so for someone who just asked, I turned my uh, flow hood off for this video. Um, 
that's why I had the mask on. So normally I'll run the flow hood while I'm doing this, but for the sake of this video, I decided to turn it off because it gets pretty muffly. Um, all right, so have about two, four, six, eight, ten different petri dishes with all different types of cordyceps. And right now they're actively shooting those ascospores onto the surface. So I have my stereoscope over there that I'm going to move these dishes throughout the course of the day. And then I'll be um, isolating single spores with a scalpel. So I prefer to use a scalpel. It's pretty tedious. You can also use a loop if you want. Um, and just kind of scrape them off and then I will be transferring them onto this 96 well plate to create a variance of single ASCO spores. Then I'll be taking those single spores and systematically combining them to create different phenotypes and then when I get the time I will run all the trials of those and try to get the strongest and uh, most rigorous cordyceps out of there. So a few other techniques you can do. Um, the the um, hyper breeding video that I did last year, I'm thinking about scaling that up in these micro well plates too. There's 24 micro well plates and 96. So I think that if I cut those mushrooms down, I would be able to um, stick those to the surface like this, but it seems like a lot of work um, but anyway so once those start to germinate or once they hit the surface of the plate I'll search the perimeter and isolate those onto here and it usually takes about a week or so to colonize a petri dish with the um, with the haploid spores and then I can take those and transfer them into a liquid culture I know on my breeding video I, I cross them on the petri dish and that seems to take a little bit longer um, another option is to do this on the surface or on the the roof of a liquid culture and just have a stir bar going and that is going to allow all those spores to compete against each other and if you want to check out that video it's the hyper breeding so that's what i did last year um, the problem with that is is that you can't really get these big variations between strains so it's going to kind of select for the strongest um, genetics in that batch which that's not a bad thing but if you're aiming for different variegated strains or different phenotypes like that spiky one or the different shapes then you're going to want to isolate those haploids so that you can more systematically mate them um, and then i've got some of these slants from a couple years ago that I've been going back to to produce my uh, my mother cultures for liquid culture which I sell on Etsy so if anyone's interested I am almost sold out I've got a few left of our MMX3 and then probably in the fall I'll start trialing out uh, these various strains uh, I'm gonna pull off the the slant maybe I'll release the MMX5 again I like having just the best genetics available. Um, so that's why I kind of pulled that one off, but I tried it on a few different grains and it seemed to perform, perform well, uh, just not on rice. So um, if anyone has any questions, this video is gonna be posted after this live stream. I can't really go back and see the, uh, the feed, but I can see all right, so someone asked about using the liquid culture. So I like to use these jars and then have a, a, a lid with an injection port and a syringe filter. I did do a bin. You need a lot of liquid culture. So I have a video using the vet gun where I scaled up a liquid culture production and that worked really well. But if you're only using a syringe and a needle, I recommend this jar, uh, maybe a little bit less substrate, um, and it can give you really good results like that. Uh, these jars are a little bit too squatty, so it kind of gets choked out and does these weird gro growth patterns. But I really like these half pint 
straight up jars. Um, they work really well. You can also use deli containers. I know that there's some tissue culture, like plant tissue culture containers that work well. But uh, yeah, so I thought I'd update everyone and uh, you know bring everyone into the lab. This is one of my favorite times of the year is to breed out these cordyceps. If you're interested, I've got a bunch of gourmet cultures on our Etsy shop and I'm going to be doing um, some t trial runs for these beach mushrooms. So one of my favorite mushrooms is a hypsozygous. It's got like a sweeter flavor to it. And then I also did uh, almond agaricus mushroom and I'm gonna be running trials on those. But yeah, so stay tuned for the full micro well video. Um, I've also got a senescence video on the way. I just haven't had much time because of the newborn. But now that things are kind of settling in for the season, I'm gonna try really hard to edit those videos and get them posted. Um, I think it's almost, almost 10 o'clock here. So thanks for joining us for this hour. I really appreciate all of you guys um, and all the support along the way. I'm really excited for our new season at the farm. If you're interested in doing a mentorship, we also are doing our one-on-one -on -one mushroom experience for the first time this season. Uh, there's a lot of dates open, so go check that out on our website, freshfromthefarmfungi.com. It's a, a five day long, um, basically a walkthrough of our weekly operations. And you can stay at our cabin house here on the Front Range in Denver, which it's just starting to become nicer weather. And I'm really excited for um, all the gardening out there and just expanding our outdoor projects, which I barely touched on today. But I've got a lot of plug spawns ready um, and I'm going to be doing some outdoor inoculation with our Clitosabe species from Telluride. So uh, a lot going on, but those mushrooms are phenomenal. They're like a purple mushroom, kind of like a smokier flavor, very good mushroom. And hopefully I'll get some flushes this fall. All right, guys. So I hear um, my wife upstairs and it's almost 10 o'clock. Thanks for joining in. Stay tuned for more videos and uh, for the updates on these. And I'm going to have to uh, go grab some more, some more coffee, breakfast, and then I'll be plucking spores um, early this afternoon. All right. Thanks for joining. Until next time. Much love.